Hi, I'm Fred Coe. I wrote this article and I want to walk you through it. I'm going to skip all the pretty poetry and the imagery and get down to the basic facts because it's a long article and it's a huge issue. I don't like to hurry. On the other hand, I don't like my videos to run on too long. There's calcium oxalate as a mage stone crystal. It's what most stones are made of. Then there's hydroxyapatite, the bone mineral, intermixes in with the calcium oxalate, so-called phosphate-enriched stones. Then there's brushite, a special crystal, a calcium phosphate, very primitive structure, and it makes a certain kind of stone, brushite stone. So we have three kinds of stones, calcium oxalate, calcium oxalate, highly enriched with hydroxyapatite, called phosphate stone, and stones with any brushite, named for the brushite itself, because clinically they're a special group. We care a lot about highly enriched hydroxyapatite stones or stones with brushite, because patients who have those show up with their tubules of the kidney plugged with crystals. There's tissue damage in the kidney. There's nephrocalcinosis, where the whole kidney is filled with crystals, usually not so much stones as the plugs. They're often confused, by the way, with medullary sponge kidney. Now, the cause of phosphate-enriched stones is too alkaline a urine. And the reason for the alkaline urine is partly being a woman, partly having certain genetic traits. And I'm going to teach you that. Now, strictly speaking, as a diagnostician, if you have over 50% calcium oxalate in your stone, you're called a calcium oxalate stone former. If the average is above 50%, you're called a phosphate stone former. But realistically, if your stone content is much above 10 or 15 percent, you're already rather unusual. And you should worry about phosphate and worry about where you're going. As I pass through here, uric acid, struvite, or cysteine in a stone are special cases. And I'm not going to cover that here. I want to go past this table, which is just a count me up of how many patients out of a thousand were this or that. Just point out that in my clinic at this point, a majority were calcium oxalate stone formers. But that's not the way to tell the story. Here is how to tell the story. This is the percent calcium phosphate in the stones for those thousand people. Zero percent, in other words, unmeasurable. A very large number of men and women. One to 10 percent very large number of men and women. A majority of all the people we had seen to that date for whom we had this kind of detail, those are the routine calcium oxalate stone formers. 10 to 20 percent is getting up there. There's not so many people. 20 to 50 percent, you're getting up near an equal sex ratio. These were predominantly male. 50 to 70, 70 to 90 percent. These are massively phosphate stones. Women are about half, maybe a little less than half. All phosphate, essentially all women. The Mayo Clinic Stone Lab gave us a much larger number of stones, much less information, so to speak. Each person was contributing their first stone here to this 43,000 are in the graph. There's three different things graphed here, and I want to spell them out for you. First of all, the blue dots. That's just for fun. It's the percent male sex and female sex over these age groups. At the very beginning, boys outmeasure girls, interestingly enough. And then as you get older, the sex is about the same. This isn't the population. And then the men begin dying off pretty fast, and you're left with the well-known uh, company of widows. Overall, for all ages, there were about equal numbers of men and women. Interesting. 
Now let's get to the stone formers. This is the ratio of male to female. It's shown by the blue bars, stone formers. Boys predominate, and then girls predominate, and young women. Then they come to equilibrium, and the men predominate in later life. For all comers, all ages, all times, men predominate over women as stone formers, mostly because of this midlife onrush. The um, red dots is just a fraction of all stones formed by age. And you can sort of see that for all sexes combined, both sexes combined, the majority of all stones are formed in the mid-years, sort of from 20 to maybe 70. And in that period, men predominate. That's why the men have more stones than women. Well, well and good. That's just about stones. This is about type of stones. Men are on top in this graph. Women are on the bottom in this graph. The legend tells you what the stones are. This is calcium oxalate stones in men. And this is the calcium phosphate stones in men. Uric acid stones in men. This is the women. It's really different. Yes, they have a lot of calcium oxalate stones and they have the midlife hump. But look what happens to them. The calcium phosphate stones really peak. They reach nearly 50% in their 20 to 30 region, even 30 to 40. Then they kind of drop off in phosphate. And they begin to make uric acid stones, just like the men, that's the diamonds. Why? Well, first of all, the men have a lower urine pH. And then second, um, the women's urine pH is higher, however, only in these middle years, these young middle years. The difference between them is most marked there. In both sexes, urine pH is going down with age. I'll show you that later. Where's brush eye? I talked about it. This is brush eye. You can barely see it. It's rare. But it happens, and if it happens to you, it's really important. Now, I want to go on to some factors that promote phosphate stones. This is percent cap in stones over decades. This is from my lab. It's been going up. Here is the relationship between stones and cap and the number of shockwave procedures per person. You can sort of get the message. More shockwaves, more phosphate in your stones. Flip the analysis, percent cap in stones versus the number of shockwaves for patients. Wow. So one thing for sure, there's something about shockwave lithotripsy that gives you more phosphate in your stones. What about a higher urine pH? Well, that's the whole basis. Neglecting the beautiful prose, neglecting the lovely links which you can read at leisure, focus right here. Percent cap in stones, supersaturation of the urine for calcium phosphate. They go up together. Of course they do. Supersaturation drives crystal formation. What about pH? Wow, look at this. The pure calcium oxalate stone formers, the urine pH is 5.9. As you start getting higher cap percents, 15 to 20%, you're way up at 6.2. This is a logarithm, 6.3. This little range, 5.9 to 6.3, spans the range from no calcium phosphate to masses of calcium phosphate. The phosphate stone formers have higher urine calciums too. More severe idiopathic genetic hypercalcuria. What about the kidney tissue? Well, you make your calcium oxalate stones on plaque. You make your phosphate stones with lots of plugging. Here's a pretty table that summarizes it. This is a different kind of nomenclature. This is your routine calcium oxalate stone former. This is your brushite stone former. This is the stones made mostly of bone mineral, hydroxyapatite. This is our work. 
calcium is higher in these phosphate stone formers. The supersaturation for calcium phosphates, higher. pH is higher. This is the deposits in the kidney, the plugging. There aren't any or virtually none in these calcium oxalates. But look, this is 4 and 12 per millimeter cube of tissue. That's a tiny amount of tissue with all this plugging. This is the number of the size of the deposits. They're very big in the brushites, smaller, but more numerous in the apatites. Stones on plaque, they all have some plaque, but there's 10 per patient on plaque, 3 out of 25. Look here, injury. There's tissue injury in the brushite and the hydroxyapatite foam formers. There's fibrosis in the cortex of the kidney. Well, you say, that doesn't sound good. We don't want to have phosphate stones. So why are we getting them? Well, because your urine pH is high. Why is your urine pH high? Well, women have higher pH. I showed you that already. They have more phosphate stones. Here's urine pH with age. This is women, this is men. They're higher. They're higher at all ages. And the urine pH is going down in both sexes. Why is it going down? Well, I don't know. I wrote a whole paper on it. If you click on that link, you can read about it. As it goes down, the phosphate gives way to more calcium oxalate, which doesn't care about pH, and uric acid. What about shockwave lithotripsy? Well, I already said there's an association. Here's an experiment. Our group actually shocked with a shockwave lithotripser one kidney of a pig and left the other one alone. And we looked at the difference in urine pH between the two kidneys. The one that got shocked had a nearly two-tenths different in urine pH. You might say that's a very small difference. Well, the whole difference between calcium oxalate stone formers and calcium phosphate stone formers is four-tenths of a unit. So lithotripsy can make the urine alkaline. This is great reading if you have time. You love it. What about humans? Why else do they make an alkaline urine besides lithotripsy, besides being female, besides being young? They make because they make too much ammonia. Oh, don't stop listening. Don't walk. Listen to this. Stay with me a few more minutes. You'll be happy. These are capstone formers. These are calsox stone formers. These are normal men and women. This is a clinical research center. This is when we feed them. Don't look at the fasting, it's boring. Look what's happening. The ammonia is too high in the female and the male cap stone formers. They might say, that's the most ridiculous thing you could ever tell me. What am I supposed to make of that? If the kidneys eliminate acid from your body as ammonia, they don't have to lower the pH. So if you make more ammonia, you're going to have an alkaline pH. Why would the kidneys do that? I don't know. I think it's genetic. I think it's an area for great new research. I think that doctors, if any of you listening are doctors, should take a look at the 24-hour urine from your capstone farmers. I bet you're going to find that. I wasn't expecting it. Now, you know citrate is very important for preventing stones. If you read this site at all, it binds calcium. It inhibits crystals. The male phosphate stone formers have way too little citrate. The females have too little citrate. So they don't have enough citrate. Why don't they have enough citrate? The kidney tubules are not excreting the normal percent of the, of the citrate filtered into the kidneys. Phosphate, normal. Phosphate, normal. The same part of the kidney that reabsorbs citrate makes ammonia. 
It's called the proximal tubule. There's something wrong with the proximal tubules of phosphate stone formers. I'm going to leave this incomplete distal renal tubular acidosis. I don't really believe uh, the syndrome exists. I'm going to leave this too. The story is wonderful but very in intense. We showed that certain people convert under our very eyes from calcium oxalate to calcium phosphate. Those who convert have more phosphate in their calcium oxalate stones and they have a higher urine pH when they're calcium oxalate stone formers. Well, let's skip through to treatment. What do you do? I can't lower the pH. So I'm stuck with a risk factor that's immutable. So I have to rely on everything else, fluids. Here, you have to push up to two and a half liters a day. Buy yourself that insurance because we don't have as many things we can do for you. Reduce the calcium excretion. Phosphate stone formers tend to have very high calcium excretion even compared to calcium oxalate stone formers. And we use everything we've got. Yes, reduce the diet sodium. Yes, below 100 milliequivalent. That's 2,300 milligram a day. Yes, even better, to the 1,500 milligram a day that the American people all should be eating. Get rid of the sugar. The sugar causes spikes of calcium. Go ahead, dump it, give up your love for it. I did, you can do it, the US guidelines call for it, go for it. And yes, use thiazide. You heard me. This is the group where I say, use it and use it early. Don't wait to see if you're gonna form more stones, you probably will. These are recurrent stones, I'm not shy about adding the thiazide. I do my best with sodium. I do my best with water. I do my best with sugar. And if I can't get to my end point, I use thiazide. What's my end point? Calcium phosphate supersaturation. What is that? That's on your lab report. And what is it measuring? Supersaturation with respect to brushite. Do you remember the exotic paper I put up on my site last month and none of you read it? Why it's so important to lower brushite supersaturation below one? It's because it starts all stones. For phosphate stone formers, it is the stone. That's what you look at. You lower it below one. What about potassium citrate? We use it all the time. I don't use it here. Why? because it raises the urine pH and is not usually going to raise the citrate as much as the urine pH because these people have something wrong with their proximal tubule. What about the diet oxalate list? Stone farmers swoon over them. They love them. It's not so relevant here. Yes, it may be high. The stones have calcium oxalate. Yes, if your oxalate's too high, Look at your diet. But you can't do everything at once. If you're a phosphate stone farmer, let's keep an eye on the phosphate. How do we monitor treatment? We look at the calcium phosphate supersaturation. Of course, we look to see, did you really raise your volume? Did you really lower your sodium? We ask you, for goodness sake, did you try to break your sugar habit? Did you really take the thiazide? Or will you? The stone prevention aims just where I've outlined with, a, with my marker. It begins and ends there. That's all I have to say. You can read the article. It's very long. It's probably longer than I wrote it. And by this time, my, my voiceover is too long. And so now, I'm going to leave you. Thanks for listening, and goodbye.